think most of you know who I am, uh, Dave Newhart. I am president of the Yelp Springs Historical Society, and I apologize for the fact, for those of you who are regulars, that you've had to listen to me twice this year, uh, <laughs> once in the spring and once now. But it seemed, or yeah, you could be married to me and have to listen to me. <laughs> Somebody's voice carries. <laughs> um, we just thought it was too much of an opportunity with the 100th anniversary of Armistice, the signing of the Armistice to ending World War I, not to have some sort of a program uh, commemorating uh, the part that Yellow Springs played in World War I and the impact it had on the village and the village's uh, portion of that. As you can see, uh, by, if you turn on television this morning, uh, we're not alone. They're, they're commemorating this day um, all over Europe as well. Uh, and it, it started in June of 1914 when a man by the name of Gavrilo Princept, who was a Bosnian Serb, um, and some things never calm down, um, <laughs> shot Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was the heir apparent to the Austrian uh, throne. And at that time, Austro-Hungary was one of the two large uh, Central European empires along with the, with the German Empire. Um, it happened in Sarajevo, so again, a, a name that uh, rings in more recent history, and it set off a chain reaction because of the, of the various um, alliances that had been created uh, before that time. Um, uh, countries got pulled into it, coming to the defenses of other countries, uh, uh, Russia because of the actions in, in uh, the Far East, uh, Germany, uh, England, France, uh, and all those great powers in Europe um, started in on each other. Uh, Turkey, uh, which was known as the Ottoman Empire at the time, uh, and, and it, it quickly escalated and, and quickly uh, led to fighting along the, the French-German border in particular um, that in 1914 and on uh, that settled into a stalemate um, in the trenches. French warfare, where millions died. Meanwhile, in the United States, uh, there was some interest in what was going on, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but I really want to start with what it was like here in Yellow Springs. And this is, a, this is probably a little bit after um, the period we're talking about. Maybe, maybe uh, about the time of World War I or slightly afterwards. And it was, it was a, quite frankly, a fairly quiet town. The population was stagnant. 1,300 was the population in the census for a number of, of censuses before uh, 1910, 1920, uh, and, and would continue to be um, uh, afterwards for a little while. So there, there wasn't much population growth. There wasn't much economic activity. There were stores. Uh, and with the, with the traction line, you can see the, the traction line going right through here. Um, and the traction office, in fact, was right, was right here. There was actually more contact with the outside world um, than there had been because uh, there were uh, regularly hour, hourly service to Springfield or to Xenia and then from Xenia to uh, Dayton. So you could see the rest of the world. And of course, the automobile uh, had made its presence, and that was connecting the town to the outside world. But it was still a quiet place. It was still a really a, uh, a farm town with a small college. And the college isn't really going to see its, its uh, growth spurt until after this period. It was um, under, the, under the leadership of President Simeon Fess, who served as a sitting congressman at the same time he was president of the... Uh, of the college, and he would go on to be a, a U.S. senator uh, from Yellow Springs. But it, it was quiet, not much happening. There was a, a, a regular cycle to village life. Um, and, and to show its farm roots, one of the events, sort of the, the year began, 
in January with the Farmers Institute. And it was a chance to bring all the farmers into town for lectures at the Opera House. And they would stage a play that would be of interest to the, uh, the, the community to raise funds for this Farmers Institute. But it was a, a regular, uh, regular occurrence. And this was, the Opera House was really the, the center of town life. It was where meetings were held. Um, uh, theater, traveling theater companies would come through. And uh, uh, <laughs> I've got a, 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 um, an advance, a letter from an advance man who's checking out uh, <laughs> Yellow Springs before uh, a, a tour, or a, a touring show comes through. And he said, this town's pretty dead. <laughs> it was on Dayton Street. Um, yeah. At a corner to the Methodist Church. Exactly. Right, and and a and a loss that that we don't still have it. And no, uh, further west. Uh, and, and one of the things that had been part of that normal cycle, there was the. The, 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 the annual cycle included the Farmers Institute, it included commencement in Antioch, it had included for a number of years, uh, really uh, sparked on by uh, uh, Simeon Fess, uh, a Chautauqua, a tent Chautauqua. Uh, and this is, this is the tent on um, the, the college grounds in 1912, but it had been discontinued. It hadn't been tremendously successful the last few years, and so, if I, I, I sat down and decided to prepare for this, I ought to read every Yell Springs news from uh, 1916 and 1917 and, and uh, 1918. And it turned out that uh, um, it was, it had, the, the village was actually, or the newspaper was promoting the Miami Valley Chautauqua because this had been discontinued, but Fess was involved with it um, and, uh, uh, and, and was held at the little community of Chautauqua on the Miami River um, in Butler County. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, was in the news and of interest to local uh, people, and again, <laughs> one of the things we're going to see in this is that, that, that these cycles occur, was building a new school. And uh, uh, there was concern that the old high school was uh, of insufficient size and quality for uh, uh, the school children of the village, and, and there was concern. There was the rating by the state was actually going to be downgraded. Interestingly, there were two school districts. There was a Yellow Springs school district, and there was a Miami Township school district. Two separate boards, but they had to work together. And um, and, and in early 1917, they they finally got approval to. Um, uh, build a new high school uh, on land that was given to them by John Bryan. Uh, it had been the site of the old Yell Springs Hotel, uh, uh, which had burned down in 1902. But when they went out for bids on the new building, because of the times in 1917, um, the, the materials cost came in too high, and so they couldn't, within their budget, build it. They would postpone the construction of the new high school until after World War I, and, uh, and that was when Bryan High School, uh, the current village building, was built. Another thing that was really occupying a lot of attention uh, at the time was the possibility of prohibition. Shall Ohio be the booze dump of four states? Uh, vote dry. And what, what was going on was the individual states were taking on the, uh, the concept of prohibition, and the states around us had approved prohibition. Ohio, in I think it was 1915, had disapproved it. In 1917, another proposal on the ballot to uh, outlaw alcohol in Ohio, uh, and there was a strong uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, chapter in Yellow Springs, uh, and the editor of the newspaper was clearly a dry, uh, uh, um, dry, yeah, dry. Um, uh, were uh, so seventeen. There was another proposal to um, uh, to to go dry, and it was. It turned out it, it was not approved again. But there were all sorts of articles in the paper about 
uh, okay, the, there's a lot of claim that one reason for not adopting prohibition is you'll put all these breweries out of work, all these brewery workers will be without jobs, and the, the counter argument was that other states that had done that had quickly converted their breweries into other, um, uh, other industries and it hadn't hurt population at all. So a lot of back and, and forth on, <coughs> on that and on those uh, referenda, referendums. Oh, uh, Yellow Springs actually had some exposure to the military in 1915 when the Ohio National Guard um, uh, held its encampment here. Um, really, used, they used, I've got a, a great map showing this, uh, the whole eastern part of the township from Yellow Springs east towards Clifton as their maneuver ground. So uh, I don't know what those poor farmers uh, did for that, but, but here's, their, here's their camp. So it was a, it was a, big, it was a big thing. Where um, was the camp? Um, south and east of the Glen, I believe. But I'm not sure whose farm it was that it was on. And I, I can probably figure that out. Um, it wasn't going to be very long after this, the next year in fact, when the, another shade of the present time, the Ohio National Guard, along with the National Guard of some other states, got called out and sent to the <coughs> Texas border because of marauding Mexicans. Uh, in that case, it was Pancho Villa, uh, who had, had crossed over into New Mexico and, and shot up a town in, uh, in New Mexico. So it was a little bit uh, different type of caravan, if you will. Uh, the third Ohio National Guard, which was the, 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 the National Guard was divided up into regiments based on geography. And so this area was covered by the 3rd Ohio National Guard. And we'll hear more about 3rd Ohio National Guard. But it included um, armories and companies based in Springfield, Xenia. The headquarters uh, were in Dayton. So really in this general area. They were one of the, uh, the regiments that got called up and, and sent to uh, um, El Paso is where they ended up serving. Here's a, another. Uh, remnant of that encampment. Well, while all this was going on locally, uh, we've got to look a little bit at what happened, what was going on internationally. And in May of, of uh, 1915, the uh, English liner Lusitania was um, torpedoed by a German submarine uh, with the result, of, or with the loss of about 1,200 people, including 124 Americans. Um, and the U.S., of course, protested this. The Germans, um, and, and in fact, threatened to, to break off relations with, with Germany. Um, the, the Germans threatened to, um, or excuse me, the Germans uh, agreed in the Suffolk uh, res resolves or, or pledge uh, to not. Uh, torpedo um, passenger ships and cargo ships without first warning them uh, and, and allowing them to uh, the passengers to um, escape. But in, in 1917, the beginning of 1917, the Germans saw an opportunity really to starve out um, the English because the war had been going on, there were shortages of everything in England, and they the, the German admirals predicted that with six months of intense uh, submarine warfare, they could starve out as, or starve England into, into surrender. And so they uh, started a campaign of uh, torpedoing ships without warning. Um, and in fact, in, in early 1917, at least seven US ships were, were sunk by German torpedoes. And then there was the, the Zimmerman telegram, the infamous Zilma, Zimmerman telegram, in which um, a, a telegram from Germany to um, the president of Mexico uh, inviting the Mexicans to enter the war on, on the side of the Germans. And if they did that, the Germans promised them Texas, New Mexico, uh, and, and 
in some of the other uh, southern states. And, and they figured that that would keep the Americans occupied. Um, and, and they knew that the, 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 the um, uh, unrestricted submarine, the U-boat uh, activity, the sinkings, were, was likely to bring the Americans into the war. They just thought they could end the war by, uh, with the submission of, of England before America could really get geared up and, and uh, um, off to, uh, to fight in Europe. And you've got to remember, uh, the backdrop of all this is President Wilson had been reelected in 1916 uh, with the pledge, he kept us out of war. And in fact, there was a strong, um, strong uh, view in the United States that we shouldn't be involved in, in the, this war among these decrepit uh, uh, European empires, and, and we shouldn't be involved. But that really changed. Um, uh, it, it changed with the submarine warfare. It changed with the uh, Zimmerman telegram, uh, and it changed probably with, with some just general um, uh, seeing what was going on in, in, in Europe and, and uh, choosing sides. One guy who chose sides, though, was this Yellow Springs. Uh, um, well, I, I, Scott Sanders likes to say that Simeon Fess put the Fess in professor. Well, um, I, I like to say that John Bryan put the eccentric in Yellow Springs. Uh, he, he, was, he was truly a, a, an eccentric, but he came out, beginning in 1915, really, with uh, something that, as far as I can tell, he was the primary uh, force behind, which was the German-American Educational Propaganda Association. So I'm not sure we would have picked that title today, the marketing people, but uh, Brian did what he wanted to. And he argued that the, the whole world would benefit if the US uh, allied itself with Germany because that would end the war more quickly and, and, and get, to a, get to peace. Um, and Brian, with his normal self-promotion, uh, at one point, released to the newspapers the fact that he had sent telegrams both to President Wil uh, Wilson and Count von uh, Bornstorff at the uh, who was the Russian or the German ambassador to, to the US suggesting his plan and that this would end the world the war but it, it really wasn't uh, it wasn't taken up and uh, and what had happened instead is on April 2nd of 1917 Wilson President Wilson, asked Congress to uh, declare war, and four days later, um, um, Congress did declare war on the German Empire, April 6, 1917. Um, the U.S. really had a small army at the time, had a small navy at the time, decrepit navy, really, and so that we had to spend a lot of money on, on coming up to speed, uh, and in fact, one of the first things Congress did was authorize drafting 2.8 million men for an army. Uh, and, and by the summer of 1918, the next year, when things were really get, getting geared up and training had occurred, we were sending 10,000 men a day uh, to Europe to fight. Uh, and in fact, in 1917, and this is, take it for what it's worth, but um, the uh, uh, Congress extended citizenship to uh, the residents of Puerto Rico, uh, specifically so they could be drafted. Uh, um, it had been a territory that was was captured from Spain in the Spanish-American War. So this this is this became probably the theme song for uh, World War One over there. Um, it was written by uh, George M. Cohen the famous composer, and who wrote such uh, songs as The Grand Old Flag, uh, Give My Regards to Broadway, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. And he woke up the day after war was declared, and this was going through his mind, and he wrote it down that same day. So the very day after war was, uh, was declared. Here are the lyrics in... in um, they're, even if you don't realize it, they're, they're familiar to everybody, I think. Um, both both uh, the, the words, Johnny, get your gun, and over there, over there, the chorus. Uh, 
you know, the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming. What happened in Yellow Springs was that um, Simeon Fess, who never lost a, an opportunity to give a good speech, gave a, uh, gave a long address that morning of uh, the day that war was declared to Antioch College. And the Antioch College repeated word for word in the Yellow Springs News, and it was probably one of the longest articles that was printed by the news at any time during the war. Uh, and, and then a couple of days later, he appeared at the Opera House to, uh, to also give a speech on, on why we were in war and what it meant, a very patriotic speech, um, more like what you would expect a congressman to give than a president of a, of a college. Uh, and the, the news reported that it was only decided at 9 o'clock in the morning, on this Tuesday morning, uh, after war was declared, that they were going to have a, a, a meeting at the Opera House, but they, the word was passed by telephone and auto. Um, so, <laughs> the days before the um, internet, you still could get the word out, and then it was crowded to capacity in, in the Opera House to listen to that. This is, as, as our boys would eventually uh, go to Europe, a, a site that they would see off the ships. This is a, a view of a, uh, um, a sub, the, the convoy to protect against U-boats and the boats, and this was a sub chaser, that, but this wasn't taken by a soldier. This was taken by one of the first volunteers from Yellow Springs, uh, a woman, Alice Carr. <laughs> Uh, who had, um, uh, you know, a daughter of the, the founder of Carr Nursery, famous Carr Nursery. She graduated from Antioch in 1904, and she went to John Hopkins Nursing School in 1914. And she volunteered uh, with the Red Cross to go to Europe, and she was on her way over to Europe in June of, of, uh, of 1917, and she didn't spend up Spent, end up spending two years in a, a giant hospital in uh, uh, very near the front lines in France. So really the, the first person from Yellow Springs to make it, this is a picture of her, of Alice in her uh, nursing uniform, probably taken in 1918, so, so the year after she was there with, with uh, uh, one of our uh, doughboys. She had a, a tremendous uh, career after the war, and in fact, it would be worthy of a program sometime for the Historical Society. Um, she stayed in Europe. She ended up doing nursing and health-related uh, uh, work. She ended up in Greece, and, and finally had to uh, uh, leave Greece uh, when the Nazis marched in in 1941. Um, it, uh, it was reported at one place that, at one point, that she was one of the world's best-known women in the 1930s. Um, she, one of her comments in the hospital that she was at in, in uh, uh, Europe, that the, the Germans flew over, German planes flew over constantly, but they never once bombed that, that hospital. Um, she ended up coming back to the United States and, and, and continuing in, in uh, public health uh, with the, with the um, Near East Foundation. Well, it almost instantly in the paper, it, it, it was, what I thought was interesting is there was almost no mention of the, uh, the war that I could find in the, the paper, up in the Yellow Springs News, up until um, war was declared. Now, it, it wasn't, you know, it didn't really, focused on local news, it really wasn't focused on uh, national and international news, so maybe that's the reason, but there was lots of uh, information about prohibition, just not much in the war. But after war was declared, uh, it started picking up more articles, obviously, about what was going on until 1918, at the end of the war, probably half the newspaper was uh, <laughs> devoted to um, uh, what was going on. Um, this, now this is, if you read closely, this is the second Liberty Loan, but these were, these were like savings bonds, uh, and there were campaigns, the, the government was basically borrowing from the citizens. The first uh, Liberty Loan was for $2 billion, uh, and it was subscribed almost immediately, uh, uh, and to each state and town and uh, county had its, had its uh, 
allocated amount that it was supposed to be um, raising by selling bonds. Uh, so these are this was a comfort kit, and so the it was one of the things the the local uh, people could do. Uh, really organized a lot by the women in town uh, was to put together these comfort kits of, of things that the army might, might not provide that you could give to soldiers that were uh, going into camp. Uh, and the Red Cross in Yellow Springs uh, did a lot of, of, of these. In fact, the Red Cross uh, chapter here, uh, <laughs> the paper listed all the members uh, when they, they had a big, uh, it was really a new chapter. Um, uh, when they first started getting uh, local members, they had over 500 members, which was pretty good in a town of 1,300 uh, people. Um, and you know, in August of 1917, uh, the head of the Greene County Red Cross uh, sent a letter to the Yell Springs Red Cross and said, "Okay, here's what your allocation is. Now come up with 400 uh, knit goods. That there was a need for knit goods." 450 sweaters, 450 mufflers, uh, 450 pairs of wristlets, and 450 pairs of socks. And so these ladies would meet regularly in the basement of the opera house and, and uh, knit together. Um, uh, and uh, at one point, they, it was reported that they had sent, and this is 1917 uh, still, uh, 3,200 separate items that they had made uh, uh, to the Red Cross. It wasn't all... Okay. Uh, my, uh, my organization here is... Uh, I'm going to get off a little bit from my notes, but uh, uh, this is... I, I tried to pull some articles and, and things from the, the Yell Springs News. They're, they're really not very legible because this is computer scan of uh, microfilm, uh, but this is September, and the, um, the draft had gone into effect. And what had happened was um, the Selective Service Act of 1917, and remember I said that the, the government author authorized, or Congress authorized uh, Selective Service drafting 2.3 uh, million um, men originally. Um, so the first step was to, uh, to, to register for the draft. And everyone between the ages of uh, 21 and 31 had to register by June 5th of, of, 2000, of 1917. Uh, and then there were um, uh, periodic drafts, sometimes large numbers, sometimes small numbers of specific uh, men required for, or with skills to do specific duties, for example, there were a group uh, uh, drafted from Xenia to be spruce cutters in the, in the Northwest because of the need for timber. Uh, uh, but uh, there were 32 in the initial draft in, uh, for, from Yellow Springs. Um, the, the quota for Greene County in the first draft was 246 men. And then there were, there were just, like I say, repeated drafts after that. And that was really the way uh, a majority of the men uh, got into the army, with the exception, we'll talk about in a little bit, of the National Guard. And there were volunteers, but, but the records of the volunteers, are, it's a little hard to figure out because the counties kept track of the, the uh, drafted men, but they didn't really keep very good track or didn't have a way of keeping track of those who, who had volunteered. Uh, and so the newspapers, the Yell Springs News, the, the uh, Xenia paper, the, the Jamestown paper, <coughs> sort of advertised, contained lists at the end of the war, and asked for other names of people that had been missed. And that's really how we know uh, who a lot of the volunteers were. But it wasn't all uh, uh, all grim. Um, and, and there were ways of, of trying to raise, raise money. This is a, advertising a, a football game uh, at the, the uh, um, uh, fairgrounds in Dayton, and the 83rd Division, which again we'll talk about a little bit more, uh, which was based in, uh, in Camp Sherman in Chillicothe at the time, was playing, their football team was playing 
uh, Denison was going to play half of the half of the game, and the other half was going to be by the Dayton Triangles, which were the was the Dayton professional uh, football team that be, became one of the NFL teams of today. But uh, uh, I, I don't recall which one it was. And as and as Christmas came on in 2000 or in 1917, I'm going to keep saying that. Uh, some of our merchants tried to straddle, not really knowing quite how to respond to this. And I think this is, this is interesting. So um, uh, Weiss and Wade was the um, uh, store that was the predecessor of uh, Tom's Market. And in fact, you'll see the, the big pictures on the wall up there. That was Weiss and Wade that the pictures on, on their wall today show. But look at this. So a Liberty bond is a good investment, and so is a purchase made of Weiss and Wade. Uh, so you know, you've, you've subscribed liberally to the Red Cross, you gave ungrudgingly to the YMCA, you've given promise, positive proof of your patriotism, but the war has only began, begun, and we know you've got to conserve, conserve, and conserve, but we've got useful gifts you can buy. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't always a, a perfect straddle. <laughs> and in, in fact, some of those fundraisers, this was, this was one of my, my favorites. So uh, the Clifton Lodge of the Knights of Pythias uh, on February 26, 1918, for the benefit for the ladies of the Gre uh, Red Cross, had a pie social. Uh, one and all enjoyed the pies to their utmost capacity, and a few may have exceeded it some. <laughs> <laughs> pies of almost all varieties known were present. Um, so they, they, they would auction off the pies. After the pies disappeared the way all good pies should go, many to regain normal condition began to trip the light fantastic to old time music. Now, I'm not sure what old time music was in 1970. <laughs> Others, too far gone, were, were contented to rest or handle the pasteboards, cards, for a few enjoyable moments. So they knew how to, to throw a party in Clifton in 1970. <laughs> Well, let me talk a little bit about the, um, um, uh, the units uh, that were raised in Ohio. And then we'll talk uh, some about some of the specific soldiers from uh, Yellow Springs that serve in those units. The, 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 the first unit to go from, and when I say unit, in this case it was a division, and a World War I division was big. It was like 28,000 men. Uh, <laughs> The entire Ohio National Guard, but for two regiments, uh, got called up. And Ohio went to great lengths to keep those men together as a, rather than having them parceled out into, um, into different divisions. So the 37th Division was the, it was called the Buckeye Division. It was made up of the Ohio National Guard entirely. There weren't units from other states in it. Uh, it, it was a, a hard fought, fighting division, but, whoops. So here was the divisional symbol, and somebody should recognize that. It's, it's, the, it's the O from our state flag, <laughs> which, which had been adopted about 10 or 15 years before this. And here it is. Now, they, they really didn't, if you look at pictures, you won't see too many in-action pictures showing divisional symbols because they really didn't get authorized to uh, add them to the uniforms and their, their helmets until, uh, uh, until the war was over and before they were coming, coming back. But this is an Ohio uh, uh, a Buckeye Division, 37th Division um, uh, helmet. It's back there on the, uh, on the table and it's, it's a nice example of, of what they would have done. The 37th Division, some of these guys, including the 3rd National Guard, Ohio National Guard, which I had said was down fighting Pancho Villa, came back in 1917, never got released from federal service. They were kept in federal service, and then they were sent to uh, uh, Camp Sheridan in Alabama, uh, where they were trained before they were, they were sent overseas. They would actually um, not uh, go to Europe until the, the spring of 1918 which was really when the first um, uh, big groups of Americans started going. Uh, another unit, uh, and I haven't yet sh uh, uh, 
cert for certain uh, shown that there was anybody from Yellow Springs in this regiment. There were in the 37th Division, we'll talk about a couple. Um, in the 42nd Division, the 42nd Division was interested, it was called the Rainbow Division, and they deliberately took units from different states. The old 4th Ohio National Guard got pulled into this, and I know there were soldiers from Hillsboro uh, that served in the 42nd Division. They saw a lot of action uh, in Europe, but they were known as the Rainbow Division. Uh, this, the 9th Ohio Separate Battalion was really a, a nationally known uh, African American National Guard unit uh, from Ohio that had companies in Xenia and companies in, a company in Springfield. And these are three officers uh, from the, the, um, 9th Ohio, or the 9th Ohio Battalion. And they would um, end up serving, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, some more, in the, um, um, the 92nd Division, uh, which was an all African American division. For the 372nd, wait till I get my notes. I make sure I get the right number here. So this is the list of, I mentioned the draft before. Here's a list of, of those who <coughs> were drafted from Yellow Springs in the initial draft. Um, the, the draftees were sent to Camp Sherman, which was this uh, large recruiting camp in uh, Lancaster, I mean in uh, Tullacothe. And this was the, uh, and became part of the 83rd Division. I mentioned the 83rd before. This is the 83rd Division. And if you can tell their symbol, it's O H I O. Um, and these, the draftees, um, uh, the 83rd was really a replacement division. They got sent to Europe. They, they were part of the American Expeditionary Force in Europe, but uh, they, they weren't really, uh, didn't see action as an independent regiment. Instead, they, they sent their men and their companies um, uh, into, uh, in, into other existing regiments, with one exception, and, which is an interesting exception. And I'll, uh, I'll mention that. But they were at uh, Camp Sherman, a couple of postcards here. Of camp Sherman was a, 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 a gigantic uh, camp. It uh, uh, 2,000 buildings, and uh, it was built to house 40,000 men and, and 12,000 horses, all just north of Chillicothe. It's where the, and it's the reason why there's a federal. Uh, uh, prison there, why the VA is there. It was all uh, all on this Camp Sherman land. Um, 120,000 men passed through Camp Sherman uh, by the end of the war. There you can just see the barracks off in the distance here. Here's a, a group of new recruits at, at Camp Sherman coming in in their civilian clothes and, and uh, uh, one author refers to um, Camp Sherman as Ohio's um, Ohio's soldier factory. <laughs> they didn't. Not everything they did was uh, uh, work. This, can you, believe it or not, is a view of Wilson, President Wilson, made up of 21,000 soldiers at Camp Sherman. All the, every one of those dots. And, and you can see they're more dense as they're getting back. But here's the buildings in the background. And basically this, uh, Mole and Thomas were the photographers from Chicago. They did this a couple of camps, not just of uh, Wilson, but they would put up this gigantic pole and climb up the top of it with their camera. So they didn't have any drones to, to take a picture of this. And how they got it laid out, you know, I, I have no idea. Or how long it took, uh, or what it cost, I have no idea. Here is a, uh, um, there was, there was a, uh, uh, several photography studios that these guys could go to, and, and here's one that, I think it's the U.S. training ship Sherman for Camp Sherman, and one of the, one of the recruits. Here's one, we've got a, a connection to uh, Frank Strom, and uh, he was Shirley Mullins' uh, uh, father. 
And he was in Indiana, he was not at Camp Sherman, but just shows you what a, a typical uh, uh, recruit would have looked like. They called him Doughboys. And it's really not clear where that name Doughboy came from. It, it goes back clear, back at least to the Mexican War, uh, if not earlier. Uh, but they called him, uh, World War I really popularized the term. Well, meanwhile, back in, in Yellow Springs, um, more local fundraising efforts. Here's a, the Yellow Springs branch of the Red Cross is uh, going to have an auction, something we still do to raise money for, uh, uh, for, for nonprofits uh, on March 9th. And they'll take anything uh, to, to auction off at, at the, the livery barn in town. And uh, let me see here. I think uh, I thought oh, thirteen hundred and thirty dollars was raised. Um, at least one cake was bought for twelve dollars and fifty cents, and a pony was sold for thirty-seven dollars and fifty cents, and eggs for two or three dollars per dozen. So there were the prices were were more than what they would have been normally, but because people were supporting uh, the Red Cross effort. Another major effort fundraising locally uh, was for the YMCA. Um, and in, the, in November of 1918, so fairly late uh, during the war, Yellow Springs and Miami Township raised $2,000 for the YMCA. They sent canvassing teams out. And this, it was a different time, I guess, because they reported in the newspaper the largest amounts people gave. So uh, Ed Kelly, uh, owner of Whitehall, gave $200. Simeon Fess gave $100. Harry Stewart gave $100. Uh, George Drake gave $100. And it said, and then on down to 25 cents. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they didn't. And there was an editorial in the paper just castigating um, uh, Xenia for not having made their quota. And what's going on down there? And they aren't patriot, patriots. And Yellow Springs went over its quota, but for the YMCA, there's a a, a YMCA building at um, at Camp Sherman, and that's where uh, some of that money went. Uh, they were recreational facilities for the soldiers. Here's the inside, pretty Spartan, but uh, another one where you can see Doughboys sitting around uh, reading by the fire. Um, so then, um, not to be left out, I guess, with the Dayton football game with the 83rd Division, uh, Antioch College decides to uh, raise money by hosting a basketball game with Camp Sherman. Uh, and, and I apologize that you can't read this very well, but it's pretty funny. Um, uh, th this is the Yell Springs News reporting on it and, and reporting on the Camp Sherman basketball team. <laughs> They soon gathered their forces together and made an impregnable defense against our boys' basket. In the last half, the, the um, Army boys swept everything before them, capturing all of Antioch's big guns. It was a, it was a game of 40 to 24. So. <laughs> and here's actually a... Here, I should have had this earlier. Here's the 83rd Division football squad, first team from Camp Sherman. Things weren't all fun. This was a notice that appeared in uh, February of 1918 in the Yale Springs News reminding uh, all German uh, subjects of the emperor, emperor empire, excuse me, uh, that they had to register with photographs with the government. And, and there were also shortages, in fact, serious shortages in, in the winter of 1917-1918 of coal and other materials, plus they were, the government was urging um, the, um, um, the, the populace to conserve, to go without, and uh, you know, abstain from, this was in the spring of 1918, abstain from wheat until harvest, use sugar with, sugar with great economy. Uh, uh, Herbert Hoover uh, was the uh, uh, was the head of the federal um, 
<coughs> Federal Food Agency, I think that's what it was called. Here's another, uh, another urging, another article, urging or ad urging saving wheat, meat, fats, and sugar. Um, um, the um, Royal Baking Powder offered a, a booklet in one of these ads on 55 ways to save eggs. Uh, Greene County had its own food administration committee and it was announced that the first task was to investigate the abnormal uh, profits some, some uh, uh, merchants were making on, on sugar and ignoring the, the uh, quotas on, on sugar. So they didn't name the, the grocers that were involved in that. And the advertising even went to kids. Uh, little Americans, do your best. Eat corn mush, eat cornmeal mush, oatmeal cornflakes, hominy and rice with milk. Eat no wheat cereals. Why was that? To, to save to save for shipping to Europe was, for the army. Did not ship corn with or I, I think that the wheat was for bread and and mm -hmm. it was a more basic need. So they that that. Um, the corn served less of a purpose in the wheat as far as the, the uh, human food rather than animal food. Uh, this is advertised, this is from the Yellow Springs News, a box from home, and it's basically saying that with, with the food savings domestically, that uh, we've saved 154,900 uh, bushels of wheat and 844,600 pounds of, of meat and fat, all of which you know, were sent to, to Europe. That's millions, isn't it? 184 million? What did I say? Yeah, yeah I may have read my note wrong. That's unbelievable. Yeah, a million, right. That's unbelievable. Um, another famous composer, Irving Mullins, Oh, How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning. Um, he wrote a whole musical called Yip Yip Yap Hank which means nothing to me, but included this song, which also became very famous uh, while he was in the service in 1918. Yep, Bank was a camp on Long Island, New York. Oh, well, then that's why, he, why it was, that must have been where he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. It was an intake camp, and they prepared him, and then they shipped him out. To yeah, them. like Camp Sherman, probably. I think Hoover was Secretary of Commerce. That's why he might have put that letter in. Uh, are you sure at that point? Because yeah. I thought he was, well, uh, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. I thought it was a, it was the National Food Administration okay. or something like that that he was heading up. Uh, here's some sheet music that you can see the, the dough boy up in the left. I'm from Ohio, and that must be some French girl in the... <laughs> <laughs> well... Patriotic schools of, of Yellow Springs in the spring of 1918 dropped uh, German uh, as a course. And uh, in a community as patriotic as Yellow Springs and Miami Township, the above action is very fitting for it's very inconsistent for any people to give aid and comfort to as great a foe of civilization as Germany. Now, I'm not by, by teaching the language. I'm not quite sure that that follows. The logic is entirely there. But um, my grandfather, uh, who was a, a third generation German in Southeast Ohio, they still spoke German in the churches. The, church, the sermons were given in church, uh, and and they quit speaking uh, uh, German during the war. This I don't know how well it it uh, came out. This is a watercolor um, that was. Um, done by someone who shortly after the war would come to, to Yellow Springs, Robert Whitmore, uh, who served in, in, uh, in the Army during World War I. He, didn't, he, he was domestic, stayed domestic. Uh, well, I'd like to talk a little bit about the service of some of the soldiers uh, from Yellow Springs in, um, uh, in Europe, the Doughboys. And here, this is, came out of the 37th Division history, and it gives you an idea of where most of the fighting was by the time. I mean, the, the, the war had, had settled into a stalemate along about these lines in northeast <coughs> France 
uh, with trenches on either side. Um, and, and, <coughs> and they finally learned, both sides, that these all-out offensives where you climb out of your uh, trench, called going over the top, uh, and assault the other side, there were, there were literally hundreds of thousands of men killed in some of these assaults. Um, that that wasn't going to work, but the, the Germans, the, by the time the Americans got there, the German line was beginning, excuse me, right here is where the first line was, uh, was beginning to, to <coughs> weaken, and the Americans provided the, uh, the fresh blood, the, the enthusiasm, a lot of inexperience um, to help with the breakthrough on, uh, on some of this line. There had been a, a major offensive by the Germans that at first they thought was going to be expensive, uh, uh, was going to break through, and then it hadn't, and that was followed by what was called the 100 Days Offensive by the Allies. Um, and, and the Americans, even at, at uh, over a million men, was really a small part of the of the army, the Allied army here, but uh, there were actions. I mean, some of the some of the guys started off here, and and, uh, and I'm going to pronounce French and, and Belgian names like an Ohio farm boy would pronounce it. Baccarat, uh, uh, Saint Mihiel, the salient uh, saw a lot of action, um, and a Yell Springs boy would be wounded here, and then in pushing this whole line. Uh, back to where it was when the, the war ended in the Meuse Argonne uh, forest, Meuse River Argonne forest area. Um, there were 1.2 million American soldiers in that line at that point. Uh, and the, um, uh, Sharon, I think you were quoting this number some, from some place, but 26,000 American casualties in, uh, in these offensives, this 100 days offensive, uh, again, in this, in this area. Um, so here's one man from Yellow Springs. And, and remember that face. I'll, I'll, I'll show you something else later on. This is um, Hiram Clark. Uh, his father ran the store, one of the stores, uh, A.E. Clark, stores in town. Uh, he was a, a first lieutenant. He joined the 3rd Ohio National Guard as a private um, before the war and served on the border in El Paso. And then when the 3rd became part of the 37th Division, uh, his unit, the 3rd Ohio, became uh, known as the 148th Infantry. And the 148th Infantry uh, was primarily made up of men from Xenia, Springfield, Dayton, you know, the area that I mentioned before. Um, he was, so he, he was an officer in that regiment in the 37th Division. Um, this man was not Yellow Springs, but had connections with um, um, Wilberforce, uh, Benjamin O. Davis. Uh, he was the first African-American general in the regular army, but he had served as professor of uh, military science and tactics at uh, Wilberforce, 1915 to 1917. He would end up um, in the uh, uh, Philippines during the war, uh, but his uh, science and tactics class trained a lot of Wilberforce students in um, the, the, I'll have a number a little bit, but it's something like uh, 30 or 40 officers uh, came out of uh, um, came out of that unit, but for the most part, and we'll talk about this in a second, uh, the African Americans didn't really get treated very well in in uh, World War One. This man, John Garlow, and I, you know, he he passed away in 1983, so these these are starting to seem really recent to me. Is one of the interesting uh, guys from from Yellow Springs. He was uh, from a farm near Clifton. He and his three brothers all enlisted. Um, his brother Jay, who wrote frequently to the Yell Springs News, uh, served as a quartermaster in uh, uh, Paris during the war. So he, he had a, a pretty good. Well, um, but Lawrence, which is what he went by, uh, 
went to Ohio State in aeronautical, for an aeronautical school at the beginning of the, of the war, and then was sent out to California to learn to fly, and he ended up with the uh, something called the First Day Bombardment Group, the 11th Aero Squadron. Um, and hopefully, oh, there. It, and this is a, a, a fantastic picture. I can't pick him out here, <coughs> but this is our flying officers of the 11th uh, Aero Squadron, one of the first bomber units, uh, U.S. bomber units to serve in France. Uh, and they, they flew these planes, talk about a small world, they're all uh, Dayton made, uh, built uh, uh, Wright Air, Wright, Dayton Wright Airplane Company, not the Wright Brothers, the Dayton Wright Airplane Company that built um, heavy planes, uh, these were de Havilland fours uh, for service in the uh, uh, World War I. So he flew a Dayton built plane and on September 26, 1918, he was part of the sortie by this uh, uh, 11th Aero Squadron, which was the first time U.S. planes, uh, bombers, flew across German lines into the, the rear of the line. So he, he was one of the first um, U.S. pilots to fly across uh, uh, German lines. And notice that symbol. And you can't see it very well there, and I've got a sort of a poor picture here, but this is this is what it was, and one of the members of that unit was uh, uh, a man by the name of McManus, and he was George McManus, and he had started the comic strip Bringing Up Father, which some of you may remember, in 1913, and this is Jiggs because uh, he drew the um, the picture carrying a bomb, uh, uh, and uh, that that. Uh, Cartoon strip or comic strip lasted until 2000, by the way. So. Here is another um, really famous uh, officer uh, from Wilberforce. Um, he had uh, he had led the the cadets at Wilberforce earlier in the 1890s, and then he had uh, become part of the the ninth. A separate battalion of the Ohio National Guard I mentioned before, the all African American unit uh, in the Spanish American War. And in July 1917, he was, uh, he was Colonel, he was medically retired from uh, the, uh, uh, the U.S. Army, sort of against his wishes. And to prove what kind of shape he was in, he rode a horse 500 miles from Wilberforce to Washington, D.C. To say, hey, I can, you know, <laughs> I can take anything you give me, uh, but uh, uh, he wasn't, he wasn't, the, the, the retirement wasn't rescinded. He was the, the third black graduate uh, of uh, um, West Point. What was his name? Uh, Charles Young. And in fact, his house at Wilberforce is now owned by the National Park Service. Um, George Sanford was a, uh, another uh, local African-American, and there were a, quite a few African-Americans from Yellow Springs who served. I've counted, I think, 15. Um, many of them went into what they called pioneer units. It was a very segregated army at the time, and these pioneer units were basically work units. I mean, they built railroads, they, they built behind-the-scenes uh, camps and so forth. They, they, they really um, didn't get uh, treated very well. But George Sanford uh, was, uh, had joined, had been li um, uh, drafted and went into uh, the 372nd Infantry, which uh, was made up of that old 9th Separate Battalion and other African American units that from different states, uh, National Guard units, were all pulled together in the, three, the 372nd. And the 371st and 372nd, which were uh, uh, both African American units, the, the white units in uh, Europe didn't want to fight with them. They didn't want them part of the units. Well, these two units got attached to uh, the French 157th Division, the, called the Red Hand or the Bloody Hand Division, because that was their their symbol, and um, they 
uh, were accepted by the French because the French, uh, or um, as, as an example maybe, that the French had been fighting with their colonial African uh, units beforehand. And these guys saw a lot of action in the Meuse-Argonne. In fact, they got the French uh, Croix de Guerre for um, their gallantry in, in uh, uh, um, fighting with the 157th. And the 157th, added, uh, there was a, a special flag created for them for the, for the 371st and 372nd with the American flag on top of the French tricolor and the, mm. and the, uh, the red hand. They, they uh, by the way, su um, suffered 579 ca casualties in uh, New Sargon. Uh, here's another soldier from, from Yellow Springs. Uh, uh, interesting, different unit, 155th Ambulance Company uh, with the American Expeditionary Force in Europe. A couple of others that I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll mention. Um, Louis Reinwald was, a, and these are just random. Everybody's got a story. Uh, these are just a few random because the, the units were interesting or a little different. He was 20 years old. He joined the Marines. Uh, and, and how he got from Yellow Springs to the Marines is something I don't know yet. Uh, he trained at Paris Island in Quantico, and it was in France by July of 1918. Uh, at that St. Mihal um, uh, section where the, where the Marine 6th Division, he was with the 6th Division, the 5th and 6th Marine Division really, I think, got their reputation um, in World War I for their heavy fighting. Uh, and he was wounded in action, and, and this is a letter he wrote that was published in the Yale Springs newspaper uh, not long afterwards. I've been too busy for the last two weeks to write, but I guess I'll have plenty of leisure for a while now. I went over the top with my company two days ago, and after driving the Bosch, which was sort of a, a pejorative uh, name for the Germans, about five kilometers, I got shot in the left hip by a machine gun. Don't be alarmed, though. It's not at all serious, and I'll soon be back with the company. I'm not sure that would comfort his parents. But, uh, uh, I'm able to walk a little now. Um, uh, Clay Hunter uh, from a farm family, African American from a farm family near Yellow Springs, 23 years old. Um, he joined the 92nd Division in October of uh, uh, 1918. It was one of those uh, all African American divisions called the Buffalo Divisions. Uh, they picked their symbol after the, the Buffalo soldiers that had been out with the, the African Americans out on the plains. And he was commissioned as second lieutenant. Um, the, the 92nd was um, generally served a support function. He had graduated from Wilberforce in 1917. But when he came back, he went to Ohio State Law School and uh, practiced in uh, um, Columbus and Cincinnati, and I believe became a judge. Uh, another, Yellow, another Yellow Springs guy was a, who, who probably had the most battle recognition honors of, of any uh, soldier in the, uh, uh, from Yellow Springs in the Army. He was in the motorized transport company, and these guys got sent to Detroit to learn how to work on, on trucks, which, you know, this is the first really motorized war. Um, and he was in, as a result, every American campaign of, of, the, of World War I. Uh, he, was, he listed himself as a retail merchant in, in um, was 29 in Yellow Springs at the beginning of the war. Uh, Ralph Malfour Fair um, was 21, and he uh, went into something that became, uh, this is a, a horrendous thing, but the, the first gas regiment, the first U.S. gas regiment, and they were armed with four-inch mortars to, sh to shoot gas shells at the, uh, uh, at the Germans, although uh, in the history of the regiment, it says that the government, with their normal uh, efficiency, trained them in the U.S. by marching, just teaching them to march and handle guns, so they didn't really know what they were, did, were doing and didn't get trained until they went to Europe. And then the guy who I think probably, I said somebody earlier, had the most dangerous job in the, in the Army from Yellow Springs was John Young, um, and he's, he was the mess sergeant for a machine gun battalion. <laughs> and, 
not a good thing to uh, not a good thing to 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 do. So here's another man from Yellow Springs, uh, Clarence Smedley, in the 148th Infantry. That that uh, unit that be, had the Third National Guard had become 21 years old, and in uh, at, at the very end of the war, the um, the 37th Division, another U.S. division, and French division were ordered to take the the I'm gonna mess this pronunciation of the Scheidt or Scheldt River, and the it's also known in French as the Esco River, and it's the river that that goes through France and Belgium and Belgium and ends up at Antwerp, um, and the bridges had been taken out, so these three. And the Germans were in force on the east side of the, the river. Uh, these three divisions just sort of stopped. And uh, the 148th, the, especially the 3rd Battalion, which included the Xenia Company, um, and the 112th Engineers were ordered to the front to m make this uh, river crossing and to build a pontoon bridge so that the divisions could come afterwards. And they were really pinned down. Uh, one guy from the 148th swam across the river and uh, to map out where the um, the Germans were and uh, to try to get the American artillery to, to focus in on on where they were and in fact there's there's copies in one of the books of, of a telegrams that the commander of the third battalion kept sending back uh, you know where's the artillery we need the artillery but um, the, those two units saw a lot of action. They were the only ones of those three divisions that finally made a bridge uh, connection and got a pontoon bridge up the 112th Engineers, which was part of the 37th Division, built, built the bridge. Uh, but in the course of that, um, Clarence Smedley, one of our, our local boys, was killed on, uh, on November 1st, 1918. Um, uh, and he's buried at Flanders Field American Cemetery and Memorial in Baltimore. And we also had a, uh, so one, one man in the 148th, one man in the uh, 112th Engineers, and he was an engineer, Edgar Van Kirk from, from Yellow Springs, mm -hmm. and wounded and died on November 11th. Mm -hmm. so. last day of the war. Where are these tombs found? They're at Flanders Field Cemetery in Belgium. So it's American Cemetery in Belgium. So meanwhile, while the fighting was going on in Europe, the fighting in the U.S. was uh, the flu epidemic. And they called it Spanish flu because it first was really recorded in Spain. It really didn't come from Spain. But Spain was neutral and... and they actually recognized it, um, and it, it's H1N1 uh, virus, but there was really no way at the time of, of combating it. There was estimated 500 million people who were in fact, not died, but who were infected with the flu in 1918, a third of the world's population. I mean, it's just in, incredible. 675,000 people in the United States. Uh, Camp Sherman was particularly uh, hard hit. And October, November of 1918 uh, was when this really, uh, really came to a head. There were articles or warnings in the Yellow Springs News not to, not to have any uh, public meetings, uh, no parties. Uh, uh, so things just really shut down. Kids were pulled out of school. Um, and a statistic that I thought was uh, amazing was that the life expectancy in the, of, a, of a person in the United States dropped from 1917 to 1918 by 12 years because of the impact of the influenza. Um, in one week in October, 1,500 Ohioans died. Um, uh, between October and January, um, um, six, 600, over 600, almost 700 uh, people in Dayton died. Um, and 150,000 Ohioans overall. Um, actually, one of the, in Yellow Springs, one of the hardest hit 
groups uh, was Antioch College. And Antioch had started a um, student army training corps unit. Uh, it didn't really get geared up until October of 1918. Uh, they needed uh, 50 students to do this. They shared an instructor with St. Mary's Institute, which is now known as University of Dayton. Um, but they said that was fine because they could get back and forth on that interurban easy enough. Uh, they were really worried because they could only get every boy of eligible age on campus join. Uh, but they were still seven short, so they had to send out the word to Cedarville and to some of the surrounding towns and, and got enough uh, additional uh, students of, of the right age between 18 and 21 and joined. And they, and they did the military discipline. They uh, like they were in the army, they, they had some military, military classes, but they also took the regular classes as well. And this is probably taken <coughs> in, uh, in late October because that's when they finally, uh, uh, they finally got their uniforms, or excuse me, November is when they finally got their uniforms. It looks they, like the steps of main building. I think that's exactly where it is. And this is a cool picture. So they were, they were discharged in uh, December of 1918, the war was over. There really wasn't much need uh, for them anymore. And so they had a farewell dance. Uh, and this is Kelly Hall, which there aren't a lot of pictures of this, but Kelly Hall had been the chapel in the main building. And, uh, and you can say what you think about the, the, the symbolism of it. But uh, Ed Kelly had given money to a, a number of years before this to convert the chapel into a basketball arena that they could hold, so they could hold the county basketball tournaments. Yeah, and so that's why it, it looked like it did at the time. Um, you said earlier that they started drafting 21-year-olds through 31. Did they uh, lower the ages at all as the war got on? Um, no, 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 I don't think at the lower end, I don't think okay. they lowered it at all. So any of students were too young? Yeah, yeah, they're too, so that's why they had this student, uh, they, they, were, they couldn't really join, but they were, the idea I think was that eventually they would be able to when they turned 21. Um, so at 5 a.m. on November 11th, uh, 1918, the Germans and the Americans and the English and the French met in uh, Marshall Folks. <laughs> Uh, private railroad car in, uh, okay, somebody with knows French, correct me, Campaign Forest, um, and signed an uh, armistice that was going to be effective at, on the, at the 11th hour of the 11th day, which is what it was, of the 11th month, um, 11 o'clock on November 11th, um, to, to cease hostilities. Uh, the Germans would withdraw behind the Rhine. Uh, the Americans or the, the uh, Allies would occupy the Rhineland. Uh, there would be surrender of materials. It wasn't a peace treaty. It was an armistice ending the war. Um, uh, and, and interestingly, in World War II, when the Germans took France, they made the French sign the capitulation in the same railroad car, which ended up getting hauled back to Germany and, and burnt in the, in the last days of, of uh, the war. This, this armistice ended up having to be extended three different times in order to, uh, before a peace treaty was actually signed. Um, so what, what do we, uh, now here's a, Again, it's not very clear. And the Yellow Springs News uh, published a list of the soldiers from, from Yellow Springs. They would repeat this on several occasions to, to try to get more people, because they never get a record of volunteers in particular, uh, to list. And so that's a, probably the best source we have of, of who served uh, from Yellow Springs. Uh, in the final list of this, 87 soldiers are, are shown. They don't include Alice Carr, they should have included her. Uh, and 18 local um, boys who served in the uh, SATC, the, the um, Student um, Army Training Corps at, at Antioch. Ohio sent 
263,000 men altogether, 5.3% of the uh, U.S. Army, and of those, 6,500 uh, uh, died from wounds. Um, but the day that that news came back of the armistice, um, people were celebrating in Yellow Springs. Uh, flags went out, bells rang, um, the SAT kids came down to the center of town and were doing some drill. Um, uh, everybody was excited and, and uh, um, <laughs> over 50 um, automobiles uh, were, daily, were gaily direct, decorated and made the tour of the county. So they went from Yellow Springs to Cedarville to Jamestown to Xenia where it must have looked good or maybe they picked up people along the way because the Xenia Gazette reports there were a hundred cars from Yellow Springs, <laughs> from Yellow Springs to town. They, 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 they mentioned that they had to wake up from Cedarville so I don't know what, <laughs> uh, I don't know what was going on there. The, you may, if you're going through an old box of, of family stuff, you may see this, uh, one of these medals. These were uh, the World War I Victory Medal for Service. Uh, they were created in uh, 1919, but they were really not sent to veterans until 1921. Uh, if, they, if they saw uh, service in one of the campaigns, there's a bar across the top usually that says what the, the campaign is. Um, something that's probably been forgotten over the years, but, but it's, um, it's important. Uh, the soldiers started coming back in early 1919, really throughout all of 1919, and in September 1919, Greene County had an official homecoming uh, for the soldiers, sailors, marines, and, and aviators, and um, you know, there was a song written in 1919 you know, how do you keep them down on the farm after they've seen Perry? So uh, I'm sure there was a lot of that. This was a generation that had uh, uh, had seen the, the world. And so what did it leave, what did World War I leave us with? Well, it, it was a, a, a very different world. If you remember in 1917, the Russian Revolution had occurred. Um, there was tremendous uh, food shortages across Europe after the war that the Americans um, <coughs> tried, to, um, tried to solve. 20 million tons pledged of food. Um, uh, the, and Herbert Hoover, according to my notes, it was U.S. Food Administration and then the American Relief Administration. Um, 70 million military, people had served in the military during the war altogether. Nine million soldiers killed. Seven million civilians. I mean, just incredible numbers. Uh, finally, in June of 1919, the Treaty of Versailles, this is the Hall of Mirrors, if you've ever been to Versailles, uh, was, uh, was signed. Uh, Germany was really forced to sign it. Uh, they, had, they were forced to accept guilt for the war, which, you know, part, partially and partially not. Their army was limited to 100,000 people. Uh, no, they weren't allowed armored vehicles, U-boats, or aircraft. 6.6 uh, .6 billion dollars in reparations. Um, and they lost about 10% of the country uh, carved up. And, and, and of course, uh, this treaty really restructured all of, all of Europe. Um, and, and the treaty also provided for the formation of the League of Nations. Um, it, it wasn't a popular treaty anywhere, but uh, it was never, never ratified in the United States because of the League of Nations and the concern about the, the League of Nations. Uh, Congress rejected it. But it also, uh, in a lot of scholars' minds, really set the stage for World War II because of what it had done to the, the Germans and maybe went uh, a little too far. Well. What else happened? <laughs> uh, the editor of the Yale Springs News finally got his uh, wish, and Ohio passed uh, prohibition on a state level in 1918, fall of 1918, and of course Congress passed the, the 18th Amendment, which then went out and was was ratified by the necessary states in in uh, 
1919, so Prohibit, the great experiment of prohibition <laughs> occurred, not very successfully, but it occurred. And uh, was a dry, wasn't he? Uh, Fest was a dry, yeah, I think Yellow Springs as a whole was, was fairly uh, dry, although Yellow Springs News, right before the election, uh, predicted that it was going to be the rural vote that was going to take Ohio dry because the farmers were, were tired of this, uh, the inefficiencies and problems with, with heavily drinking. Um, Antioch, in February 1919, it was a time of change. I mean, it really was a big change, time of change. Um, sort of brokered a deal with the YMCA to take over the college. Uh, the YMCA said it would be their national college if um, um, they could raise, they would raise $500,000 of endowment. Uh, and Grant Parker from the YMCA was installed as president, but uh, maybe, you know, it takes a certain amount of fortitude to be a president of any college. <laughs> And he quickly decided that this wasn't such a great idea and backed <laughs> off. But it was shortly thereafter that Arthur Morgan came on the scene and, and really brought about the great renaissance of, uh, uh, of Antioch College. Um, and some people, at least one returning veteran, made, uh, took a chance and, and made, uh, made a good place for himself. Uh, this is... Nathan uh, Clark from uh, uh, the 37th Division officer at Yellow Springs is now a duly employed as a federal prohibition agent. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he found his place when he came back. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I know I went long, but does anybody have any questions really quickly? Yeah. Sure. Yes. My great uncle from Cleveland served in World War I, and the family story is that he got his training in the Glen. Would that have been earlier? I wonder if it was in the National Guard with the, uh, when they were in 1915, when the National Guard was trained, you know, they had that training camp in this yeah. area. Not that, sure about that. I don't think. But, uh, but otherwise, it, it, also, if he was in the Glen training during World War I, he it, it was... Yeah. Uh, uh, Probably a wall. <laughs> <laughs> and also, on the same, there's this photograph that you see in the postcards around here that shows the old train station with the with the soldiers in World War One garb. Uh huh. Are you, are you, are you familiar I, with I'm that? not familiar with it. So you know what I'm talking about, anybody? Yeah. It's a well-known photograph that's been on postcards for years here. So. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I just never noticed that it was uh, World War One soldiers. Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, a little background. The uh, World's Fair out in San Francisco in uh, 1916, they wanted the Liberty Bell out there, and the Liberty Bell had never been west of the Mississippi at that time. And there was a big political poopar between the, the mayor of Philadelphia and the governor of the state and all that, and finally uh, they were able to get the Liberty Bell out. Well, I think the first bond sale tour was less than successful. <laughs> And uh, they decided to bring the Liberty Bell back uh, through the various states. And I think it was transported on the Miami Railroad uh, once it got to Cincinnati or something like that. Did it stop in Yellow Springs by chance? Not that I'm aware of, but the main line of the Little Miami at that point would have been from Xenia to uh, London and up to Columbus rather than up to, to Springfield. But I, I, it, it could have been in just... Um, didn't make the Yell Springs news. They didn't always get everything. <laughs> Needless to say, it was a very successful bond. Tour. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. There were some quonsets out in Bryant Park. Were those World War II or World the, War II? Those, the, C those C uh, yeah, C Civilian C Conservation Corps. Uh, and then they were moved to the college after the CCC. Next year, I'm going to do a program on the CCC. So uh, we'll come okay. Do you understand that the American Germans were treated pretty badly in World War during World War One period? Were there any consequences in Yellow Springs? Not that I not that I saw, other than the uh, uh, no longer teaching um, German in the schools. But I don't think there was a there. There were very many uh, Germans in 
Yellow Springs that, that at that point that, that would have been recognized as Germans. I mean, I'm sure there were descendants. Sure. There were lots of German uh, associations in Cincinnati with the machine tool industry. And the heavy <laughs> German population in, in Cincinnati. And, and that's really where uh, uh, John Bryan did most of his his talking and, and got most of his support for his uh, uh, German alliance idea was in Cincinnati. Sure. A few family footnotes. My uh, grandfather was one of those older than 31 uh, who had 12 brothers in the German army. He was an immigrant to the U.S. and he was drafted to build barracks at Paris Island, where somebody from here... Yeah, the, right, went. Louis Reinwald, yeah. Uh, the parochial school where my parents went dropped German during the First World War. And you'll be happy, most of you, to know that my grandfather returned to Baltimore and became famous for building stout oaken doors that it took the captain of the vice squad, Captain Emerson, a very long time to break down <laughs> while people scurried out the back. It was a prohibition agent of a different kind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Oh, uh, sure. Wasn't there a Benjamin Davis? <laughs> a great famous, yeah, I, thought, I had a picture of Benjamin Davis. Did I not say? I may have. Another uh, Benjamin Davis that was a Tuskegee Airman. His son was a son. Also, Van Cameron. I get going, and I apologize for that because I knew who was on the screen, but I, I should have said he was the one on horseback. Yeah. The mm -hmm. picture that was on horseback. But the name's what brought that to me. Oh, okay. Paul Beck yesterday or Friday got a catalog in the mail from Zay Bars in New York on Broadway. And Jane Brown, my next door neighbor, got one. Did anybody else get a Zay Bar catalog? Mm -hmm. I did. It's a Jewish food store. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I got one. <laughs> I'm not Jewish, but I got one. <laughs> And you didn't bring lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? We've got refreshments back there. Uh, make sure you enjoy yourself. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.